the geography and tourism studies department. Uh, and I've been at Brock since the since 2013. So now I'm into my sixth year. Now what I'd like to, and I guess I've been a member of the ESRIC for two years as well. I'm also an adjunct with biology and I'm cross appointed with earth science. I'm, there's a lot of moving parts going on. Um, but something that has stayed absolutely stationary and is uh, a solid project of mine that has been going on for now 12 uh, years is my work up in Old Crow Flats. And that's what I'd like to really focus on today because I think it draws in a lot of um, the different approaches and the, the pieces that I bring into my research program. I don't, I have research programs going on in near Yellowknife as well. And there's one local here too, um, but he got a job. So it's going a little slower, but either way, um, I'm a physical geography, uh, I guess, person by trade, but I'm also focused on geomatics and utilizing you know, things like what Colleen was commenting on, and, uh, 3D mapping and satellite technology, remote sensing for understanding how landscapes are changing over time and what that impact is on water resources. So uh, the main concerns that are out there there's global concerns and there's community level concerns, as we know about. And up in northern Yukon, where this shot was taken, um, the Buntuk Wichita First Nation, this is their traditional territory, and they're interested in learning more about the science uh, behind why these changes are happening so that they can enhance their adaptation strategies and resilience in the face of climate change. But then there's also international interest in understanding how permafrost landscapes like this are changing because of big questions surrounding the carbon flux to the atmosphere and potential for for perpetuating change in climate. So there's different players like um, in Alaska, there's lots of USGS researchers, NASA, I'm now an affiliate of a NASA program where this landscape is within their light domain and we're providing ground truth information to calibrate um, their sensors. And so what I do is A, inventory the types of changes that are going on, and B, try to understand how they impact the water, the lakes and the rivers, using a suite of you know water chemistry parameters with samples from lakes and rivers, um, as well as looking at some of the carbon movement. Now, I'm just gonna inundate you with a ton of photos and some figures, but basically, changing climate is amplified towards the north because of reasons I'm not gonna specify, but the fact is that it's getting warmer up there faster than it is in other places in the world. Um, and that leads to changes in land cover. Um, and this is Old Crow Flats. This, so you can see up in the, the Northern Yukon, we're in the Arctic here. It's about, if you put Toronto in there, that's the, the, all of the awards in the GTA. It's a, it's a rather large area. So starting in 2007, I was part of a community-driven multidisciplinary project where we were evaluating or, or documenting the, the natural history of this landscape. And my focus was understanding the hydrology. And I identified lakes around here that were more susceptible to change in climate because they evaporated a lot more. And we used geochemistry, uh, analytical techniques to do that. And then there were other people looking at vegetation ecology, wildlife biology, food security, uh, paleontology, uh, dendroclimatology. And we were packaging it all into this comprehensive understanding of how the landscape was changing. And so since being at Brock, I now have NSERC funded, um, I have an NSERC funded program that is building on that and trying to develop a more detailed understanding of how it's evolving. Uh, this is just a random photo put in there. This happens to be a, an area that was unglaciated over the last you know, 100,000 years. So it's a wildlife refuge. Absolutely fascinating. It's about, uh, there's evidence of people being here since about 19,000 years ago. So it starts to put to rest that whole question of how uh, people got here. And so it straddles the tundra tiger transition zone. The wildlife is abundant. Um, there's about 300,000 waterfowl here annually. As I mentioned, it's a traditional territory, the Buntuk Wichita First Nation. Obviously, there's lots of top predators as well, but this is probably the most important species that, that is, a, is a major, um, I guess, 
part of the definition of Bunza Kwitch of First Nation. First of all, the name Bunza Kwitch means people of the lakes, um, but the porcupine caribou herd is an integral part of their culture because it passes through here annually on its way to the calving grounds in Anwar in Alaska, and then back towards the Ogilvy Mountains in the winter. Uh, and so it, it in, for countless generations, has sustained people in this area who were traditionally nomadic, but are now focused in the community of Old Crow. Um, and still utilizing the resources to support you know, their, uh, their traditional lifestyles. But they're concerned about future generations and, um, and, and how they're going to be utilizing the land. And so that is really one of the strongest pieces, motivators for my research. The other, as I mentioned, is that global concern about actual physical processes, physical and biological processes going on in these landscapes and how that affects the climate. Um, so it's an interesting project for me. And I, and I do work closely with the community members. Um, but eventually, I need to integrate this research more effectively into their everyday life. And uh, so that's, that's one of the projects. Um, this is something that they're interested in as well. This is just something that we worked up where we're using Landsat imagery, so satellite technology, to evaluate where the land cover is changing throughout this, their traditional territory. And we can see where it has changed. And this does have implications for the caribou, who typically feed on the lichen there. And when you have shrub vegetation that is growing more and more because of changing temperatures, that, that can have some issues. Now getting back to a little bit of the, the science side of it, um, these are 57 lakes where we would fly around with a helicopter three times a year. We hit there, we hit about 14 of them in a number of rivers now uh, with helicopter a couple times a year. But I identified that it was really the catchment characteristics where the white outlines are that are influencing um, those lakes and, and the chemistry of the lakes and how productive they are. Um, that's dictated by how much snow they get, how much evaporation happens and that sort of thing. So we can, we can kind of gauge all of that information and get a sense of old crow flats as a whole. Um, but what I want to do is be able to tighten the data up enough so that we can model what this landscape can look like in the future. And so that involves going out taking a number of measurements. This is another example of a past study where we can see, this is one example of a uh, changing feature in the landscape where lakes are starting to drain more. Um, it, based on the Landsat data, we can see that we're getting over one lake a year that is draining where the permafrost subsides uh, in a shoreline area and you'll lose over 80% of the water volume in a year. Um, this is, this was an animation before, but this is another uh, example of a drained lake where I'm, I've tracked since it is drained, and we get a sense of how variable it is, and we also monitor how the vegetation is growing around it, and how those drastic landscape changes are affecting the water chemistry and the habitat in there. Because if you have more drained lakes in the future, you need to figure out how is that going to impact the, the, uh, the habitat and potentially the food security of people there. This is another example of a landscape change. This is technically called a permafrost retrogressive thaw slump, or landslide, you pick. Um, but it's the, frozen, the formerly frozen ground that went out as an initial pulse into the river and almost blocked the whole thing. So it has practical implications for, for transportation getting out there. I've seen more of these popping up, but it, it's not just that initial pulse it actually grows. Once you change the color of the ground, it will thaw the ground more and perpetuate more growth of it, and it will export more material. So if you get more of these, you're also releasing a bunch of whatever, however much carbon was stored in there, either into the water or into the atmosphere. So we take water samples upstream and downstream uh, from these types of features. And this is one of the, the key pieces that we're bringing in with our the NASA program that I'm part of. There's also now, uh, there was a fire in the flats last year. And we have a study lake that we've been monitoring for 12 years right in there. And we'll, we fly our drone around um, to actually to around features like this and also the fire features and utilize three-dimensional mapping to understand how um, 
this fire is going to change the ground and also we can use it to calculate how much volume is being exported. So we also provide ground truth information and data analysis that I said goes along with the NASA program to provide calibration and then we use this information to strengthen our understanding of what's driving the, the water chemistry on the ground. So if you have any questions, feel free to come by the lab, come into geography and tourism.